I'm joined today by Ben Reuter, an exercise physiologist straddling academia and practical experience. Ben is also a podcaster on the Fit Lab PGH podcast. Ben, welcome to the show. Nick, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you this evening. Let's start off with something light. It is 7 p.m. over here. What have you done so far today for your health, wellness, and performance? Well, I'm a little bit lucky in that my main job is I work from home. Uh, I teach for university, but what have I done? Uh, I think you could probably say most of my day today was set up for that. Uh, got up. First thing I did is I measured my HRV or heart rate variability. And I'm a little bit of a geek. I use the core sense right in my bed. And I've also like you use an aura ring. Um, no real surprise was there. I'm on a streak of, I'll just say well over a thousand days straight of espresso. I started out not really intending to have a streak of that. And a couple of years ago, I was out in Colorado and I mentioned to my uh, buddy, oh, this is the first time in over a year, I'm not going to have this espresso because we were going to climb Mount Chavano, a 14er. And his comment was, well, we can't have that. So at 630 at night, I had my espresso. <laughs> my whole goal was when I hit a thousand days, it was... I was just going to stop and I didn't stop. And rather than saying, Hey, I'm at 1100 days or 1200. It's just part of those morning practices or rituals that kind of settles me, you know, after I let the dogs out to do espresso, um, had the opportunity today, it was cooler. got to take the dogs to the park after that and do about 90 minutes of mostly walking, came back, did a little bit of work, had the opportunity to take about a 90 minute bike ride. Um, so a lot of movement today, a lot of activity today, and the whole goal behind all of it is obviously to have a good time, but more importantly, and I'm not sure if when we chatted before, we talked about this, to just working to long-term to enhance my health span, not my lifespan. When you use your HRV measurements, how do you incorporate those readings into your day? I use them mostly to get an idea. The Core Sense was the first one I used before the before I uh, got an aura ring, and I kind of used the Core Sense to see how it corresponds with the aura ring, and it does quite well. But I use it uh, a couple of ways. First of all, just to see if my perception uh, of my sleep quality how that was. Uh, second of all, to look at what my re resting heart rate is, and what I found uh, probably over the last three months or so is a big indicator for me about how well my H or how good my HRV score is and how rested I'm going to feel is my number of respirations uh, per minute, which the aura ring will measure. So it's not exactly HRV, but it's in all those measurements. I found that if my respirations are about 16, 16 and a half uh, breaths per minute, which again is on average from the aura ring, then generally my sleep quality has been pretty good. If it's up above 18 and, you know, we're in allergy season here in Western Pennsylvania, uh, I seem to be most sensitive to oak and maple. When that's there, I find my respirations can be up 18, 18 and a half, or the other time that I really noticed it when it, the respirations were up were the, about the first two days after both of my COVID vaccines. So I use it kind of just to say, how am I feeling? And then if I have a bad HRV score or bad respirations, kind of ask myself, why? What was it? You know, did I have that extra glass of wine? Did I get to bed late? Um, and what it is, it's not so much as, oh my God, here's what my HRV is, but it's more along the lines of a tool along with other things that I use. Interesting. I haven't thought about the correlation between respiratory rate and allergies. It's amazing. Um, my, my girlfriend has allergies and actually my dog has allergies. And from using one of the allergy tracking things, my dog and I both seem to be most sensitive to maple pollen. Huh. Is that a common one? Uh, if there are maple trees this time of year, which I think is kind of funny because one of my projects I do in the early spring is I make maple syrup. So it's kind of like, okay, I take some maple sap and now you're getting back <laughs> at me three or four months later. So what's your backstory? How did you get into exercise physiology? I got into exercise physiology. I was uh, went to college and I was going to be either a marine biologist or an athletic trainer. My first uh, class in college was plant biology and I absolutely hated it. And my first work study job, actually my only work study job in college happened to be in the athletic training room. So I got a bachelor's and master's in athletic training and I had some really good mentors along the way, professors and professionals. 
and it was one of those things kind of like people who do uh, athletic events, you're always saying, well, can I take the next step? And getting a doctorate in exercise physiology was partially because I knew that with a master's in athletic training, I would either have to go into administration or I would uh, do what I had done my first year out of grad school, which was work 48 out of 52 weekends in addition to the normal job in the clinic and in a high school. And I didn't really want to do that. And the physician I was working for at the time was trying to convince me to go to school, not for exercise physiology, but as a physician's assistant and come back and work with him as his uh, basically right-hand man or left-hand man. He was an orthopedic surgeon. And I thought about it, uh, but through somebody who I've lost touch with and a professor saying, you should get your doctorate, who she introduced me to, uh, which is kind of an interesting story if you want to get into that. I really went from saying I'm going to PA school in a span of about 36 hours to saying I'm going to get my doctorate in exercise physiology. In your study of athletes, what are you finding to be important outside of the physical? I know that, sure, athletes, especially at competitive levels, train hard, sleep hard, eat right. And then there's the whole like mental side of things, the mindset, the resilience. What have you found in your studies and from coaching, working with different people? I think uh, two things I could say. I, I would kind of minorly disagree with you with the sleep. I think so many athletes shortcut themselves in the sleep and the recovery. I think you and I chatted in our, our conversation before we started recording about how everybody wants to do, you know, more is better and everybody likes high intensity interval training. And I think one of the preconceptions that so many people have, including athletes, is if I'm not absolutely crushed, if I'm not totally tired all of the time, then I'm not going to be successful. And that's probably the farthest fr from the truth. So I think number one is the athletes who have the wherewithal, whether they have an excellent uh, coach with feedback, or they have a good support team, or they just have that innate quality where they're comfortable enough to say, okay, that's it. I'm done. I need to rest. I need to take time off. This isn't the right time to me. You'll hear me name drop and talk about people in this podcast when you interview me, not because I'm trying to show how many people that I, I know, but because these are people who are out there. One of the reasons I started uh, one of my podcasts is there's so many people out there that you never hear of who are doing these great things. And if it's just a, a dropping of a name and one of your listeners hears it and looks these people up, but I'm, I'm reminded when I say that with the first thing, uh, I work at California University of Pennsylvania and the track coach there and cross country coach is extremely good. Um, and God, I'm, I'm kicking myself because I can't remember his last name and I just got an email from him two days ago. But if you look up Cal U, he's a, a former elite level, world-class, literally 800 meter runner. And there are times where he says, when he looks at an athlete that he coaches and he says, go home. You know, you don't need to be practicing today. And I think the athletes who can have a coach like that, who are willing to trust them and listen to them, I think that's important. And the second thing, so kind of the, uh, to build on that, are those athletes who have, and I don't know if this is maturity, um, you know, nature, nurture with proper coaching all along the lines to recognize that it's not one workout. It's not one event. It's, it's a cumulative effect. And the athlete who recognizes, you know, especially if you're looking at college athletes, it's like, okay, what are the other stresses in my life? And do I need to do these sorts of things right now? And there are some really good uh, endurance coaches out there, you know, people who maybe people don't know. Um, Daniel Caulfield, Dan, I, Daniel, I apologize. He's the uh, track coach at Cal U. But people who are able to get across to athletes. And this is something that when I work with people with personal training, or when I have done coaching with endurance athletes, it's like, look, you're looking at here's your event, or here's your activity, three months, in some cases, four or five months down the line. It's much better to miss a workout here or to cut a workout short here, rather than saying, I have to finish this long run for the Ironman that I'm training for in August. Because if you push yourself so hard that you're injured, that you can't complete workouts for the next four or five weeks, that's much more detrimental to the big picture than it is if you say, okay, today just wasn't the day. There's always the risk of injury. And I'm actually, I started a training deload week today. 
where I'm backing off intensity. And although I know it's the right thing to do every four to eight weeks of intense training, it's still hard for me to wrap my mind around, okay, calming down, backing off intensity, backing off the fitness in general is actually productive. And it, I mean, just intellectually, you know that. And, and I know just from the limited time we've had talking, so intellectually go, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Psychologically and personally, at some level, you're, you're saying to yourself, yes, but I'm different. I feel good and I should be able to do that. And I mean, it, it's, it's interesting that the people who are, who are so motivated and are so intrinsically motivated are often those same ones who benefit from having a sounding board or somebody to say to them, when I was getting my doctorate in exercise phys, I decided that was uh, when I did my first Ironman triathlon. And I decided, you know, I'm going to hire a coach who really knows what he's talking about. It's somebody I knew, somebody who was very successful. And I still remember every workout of the of the 12 week block that was the final block working up to it. It was a 45 minute to an hour walk every Monday. And I still remember saying to him, it's like, why am I doing this? It's like, I'm training for an Ironman. I don't need to walk. You know, this, this is stupid. Just, just, and he would say, just do it and shut up Ben. And, you know, we had that type of relationship. And I think you and I chatted beforehand, you know, if, if you said the one thing that I found most valuable, and I think I've really learned this over the last three or four years, it's walking. I mean, I love the running. I love high intensity biking. If I get the opportunity to get on a paddleboard or, 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 or get in a kayak, I love that. But the thing that is, I think, not only physically, but psychologically, and I've mentioned this before, that's going to have the greatest enhancement of my health span. It's getting out with my dogs five, six, seven days a week for anywhere from 45 minutes to 90 minutes of sometimes just literally walking. I love that. And I do the same thing. I've tracked all kinds of physiological biomarkers and found that walking has the single biggest impact if I'm able to spread it out throughout the day. So I will often do 15 to 30 minute walks two to three times a day, especially around meals. And I feel that my energy levels are more steady and my mood increases. I feel more sharp. Just overall, it's probably the most important physical component of my routine. And, and I would add in the last four years or so, since this really has become an important part, four or five years, all of my good ideas and probably many of my bad ideas have happened during those walks that I take. And what other forms of like, non-exercise are staples in your routine? Well, I'm fortunate enough to live on a little bit over four acres. Um, a lot of it was brush when I moved in. So a lot of brush clearing, a lot of uh, one of the things that my girlfriend and I started doing when COVID started having closed downs, uh, I guess almost a year and a half ago is we started cutting mountain biking trails and walking trails in the property. So, so that anytime there's the opportunity to play for lack of a better term, you know, if, if I'm out walking and there's the opportunity, you know, there's a, there's a video floating around the, of the last couple of days of Instagram of me walking on a, a, a road barrier, not a barrier, a, a kind of a side of a guardrail park road. So there's no traffic around. So making conscious choices. If you're, if your video, if your viewers are watching this, cause I know you're doing this on YouTube too. And you see me bouncing around, I'm at a standing desk. I'm on a wobble board. And on top of the wobble board is one of those uh, rubber <laughs> Swiss ball. Yep. And so it's, it's uh, and I, I'm one of those people who I read incessantly and I say, Oh, that's a great idea. And I forget to mark it down. But one of the things I've read in the last couple of weeks is they looked at people who had long lifespans. And one of the things they found is they had a tendency to fidget more than people who didn't. So just little micro movements. So what I found is, you know, those walks that I do that are so valuable. If I just do that, that's a good base. And then the rest of the day, anything that I can add into that is an added bonus. And what I find is, it's a good base if there's the opportunity to say there's some activity or event I want to do three or four weeks down the line, I can build up to it very quickly. But it also sets me up to realize I don't want to sit around. And I think one of the things that's so important with uh, making the choice, I do that early in the morning. Because if I wait till five o'clock in the afternoon, it's not going to happen. So I recognize that if I front load my day with movement, I'm much more likely to be active later in the day 
And notice I'm saying active, not exercising, but I'm more likely to pick things that I want to do if it's a second walk, if it is a exercise bout or a workout. And this has really come true over the last uh, six weeks or so. I've had two writing projects for a professional organization. And I found both times, uh, the last couple of days when I'm putting the finishing touches on it, what I did was it's like, okay, I want to make sure I have enough time to get this in by the due date. That was the first thing I did. Guess what didn't happen as much that day? I didn't get as much activity as, whereas for the third project or the final project, what I did is like, okay, first thing I'm up for these days, I'm doing the movement, and then I'll get to that. I think the quality of the projects were good for all three of them, but my mental outlook and the way I felt at the end of the day after the third one versus the first two, I just didn't feel physically sore, mentally exhausted, et cetera. I felt, okay, I accomplished something. That was good. That wasn't too bad. And I think the trick is to remember that and carry that on subsequently when there are projects or due, due dates for things going forward. I do the same thing. First thing in the morning after I get some of the basic routines done, I'll always do some form of movement. And when I do that, I get the little rewarding dopamine hit of accomplishing something small. And that way I carry that same energy into all of the day's later projects. It's amazing. I mean, the days that you feel badly or tired where you're less likely to do that if you do do that you always feel better when you're done and i and i think uh, one of the things that's, that helped me with that is uh, we have seasons here like you do in new york and one of the things i realized the days when it's raining because i'm a by preference an outdoor mover not an indoor mover to me a, a treadmill i'm thinking i can find something to do outdoors for the same amount of time the weather's bad, it's raining, it's snowing, it's sleeting, the dogs want to go when I might not be likely to go. And I found with the proper clothing, you know, some of the best walks have been in the pouring rain, some of the best walks have been in the snow. And, you know, once you once you're out there and doing it, it's like, wow, this is fun. I'm, I'm glad that I did this. I really just like running. I love sprinting, but not running, except when it's raining. And something about the rain makes the run that much more exciting and exhilarating. I'm reminded of, of a, a former client of mine who went to visit his sister in uh, Oregon and they were going to go on a hike with, with his sister, he and his girlfriend. And his girlfriend said, well, are we taking umbrellas? And they just looked at her and said, why? Well, it's just going to rain. They said, rains every day here. <laughs> uh, similar to a friend of mine when he moved to Seattle, he said, well, you buy a good Gore-Tex jacket and when you commute to work on your bike, you put fenders on your bike. So it's so easy. And a friend of mine and a, a podcast guest, Don Moxley, has said before, you know, we put ourselves in these bubbles. You know, we go from the air-conditioned house to the air-conditioned car, if you live where you travel by car, to the air-conditioned office or restaurant. And it's like, oh, you know, it's 25 degrees out. I can't go outside. Or it's 85 degrees out, I can't go outside. Whereas if you're in places where people do that, you know, if you're in, a, in Boulder, Colorado, they're going, oh, it's 25 degrees out, must be ski time. You know, it's 80 degrees out, let's, let's go run or let's go walk. The modern human has really lost the ability to adapt to environments. And because of that, we're living in a much more like secluded, sequestered environment. Yeah, I'll probably steal that from you. We've lost the ability that when we were probably seven or eight years old, it's like it's snow. We got excited by the fact of snow. And, we, you know, when it was 80 degrees out, we were excited because, you know, that meant we get to go swimming. Or if we lived in a suburban or a rural area, they, they put out the, sprinkler, the sprinklers with the garden hose and you could do that. And there's so much that we just want to control everything. And we forget really how to, for lack of a better term, enjoy the discomfort because you know when you, when you go out and it's pouring rain and you're going to run or you're going to walk your feet are going to get wet it doesn't matter if you're wearing Gore-Tex running shoes you know you learn I'll wear wool socks I'll wear shoes that maybe aren't super heavy so they soak it up you're going to get you're going to get wet you might get a little bit cold and provided you take the, the proper precautions that you don't get hypothermia you know it's what they call type two fun. You might not enjoy it while you're doing it, but when you're hanging out with your buddies, or you're talking to your girlfriend or your wife, you're going to say, Hey, you, you won't believe what I saw. And I'm reminded one of my uh, walks with the dogs a number of years ago in the rain, I had the opportunity. It was uh, quite a bit of rain in the park. There was some flooding in the stream. The stream was quite high. And I see these three deer first time I've ever seen this swimming across the street. Two of the deer right across the stream, no problem. The third deer is carried downstream and there's a bridge probably 200 yards down from where it is. And I remember thinking, oh no, the deer's gonna die. 
oh no, the deer was riding the current until she, until she hit an eddy. Then she kind of stepped up onto the shore, shook herself like a dog and joined the other two deer. Wow. And if I'd made the decision, oh, I'm not going to go to the park today because it's raining, I never would have said, seen that. And the great thing about that is I actually had the wherewithal to pull out my iPhone and video it. So now I have it on video, which is absolutely one of the coolest things I've ever done. When the weather gets bad here in New York, there'll be some snow. As soon as I can get outside again with some clear ground, maybe even just a tiny bit of snow, I'll start pushing it and seeing how far I can go. And a motto I live by is getting comfortable with discomfort. And I'll see people in the street and they'll take photos with me because I'm the only person out there, shirtless, minimal clothing, no shoes sometimes, uh, just walking through snow or at least sub 30 degree temperatures. They ask me, isn't that uncomfortable? And of course it's uncomfortable. It's, I'm not doing this because it's comfortable. I'm doing it because I want to build my tolerance. I want to get somewhere farther than where I am today. And by slowly building it up over time, it's no longer as painful as it was before. And eventually you get to a point where it starts becoming comfortable. I'm reminded of sports psychology class in undergrad where they talked about elite runners versus very good runners. And like the elite runner is out there and they're running. It's like, okay, my legs hurt, but that's okay. They've, they've hurt before and I can handle this. You know, I need to go another 30 seconds. Okay. My breath rate, I'm breathing hard. Can I slow my breathing down? They're very intuitive of what they do or introspective. And I think we see this with so many people, not just the good runners, but just so many people who are out exercising or moving, there's gotta be an external stimulus. There's gotta be the headphones. There's gotta be where I live, there's rails to trails. And believe it or not, I have seen people walking on the rails to trails, watching movies on their phone or reading a book. I know it blows the mind. Um, <laughs> whereas when you're out there, you know, and, and you're doing these things in the cold weather, you're within yourself. It's like, okay, I'm cold. Is it too cold? Do I need to do something? Do I need to, do I need to go faster? You know, because if you exercise harder, you'll produce more heat. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully you can get back inside before hypothermia, but you know, you're not climbing Everest in, in, in a shirt and a pair of running shorts. Um, you know, is the, is it, you're constantly monitoring how you feel. And I'm wondering, and I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud, are you actually air quotes, toughening yourself up, or is your body adapting and saying, okay, I've been here before. I recognize this. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but it's not that bad. I'll be okay. It's a good question. And there are health benefits to cold exposure, extreme cold exposure and extreme heat exposure and longevity enhancing benefits. And I think it's probably a mixture of the two. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's absolutely with the sauna, you know, the, the, the heat shock proteins, having done triathlons in, in grad school and after that, and having swam in cold water, I'm hoping as more and more research comes out, it shows that the saunas are as good or as beneficial as the cold, because I hate them both. I, I dislike the extreme temperatures both. Yeah. But the memories of being in cold water, I'm, I mean, I'm very impressed with the people who do the cold water immersion because, you know, every, every new year, somebody will say, Hey, you want to do the polar bear plunge? It's like, yeah, no. <laughs> And I've also seen some research that it doesn't require extremely freezing temperatures to get some of the cold shock protein benefits. Mm -hmm. You can get those with a little longer exposure to more moderate temperatures, 50 degrees, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, for example. I'm not a glutton for punishment. I mean, that's <laughs> a lot more realistic. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. I'm not doing this dangerously. <laughs> like when I go out and shirtless, I have a backpack on with shoes and a shirt and all the emergency essentials should I need it. Like last thing you want is to get stuck way out in the middle of nowhere, not have the required gear and suffer, end up in the ER or worse. So be safe with it. That's the amazing thing is, is you know, if, if you take the safety precautions, it, it's doable. I mean, I've got a friend who He's in his 60s, who is a hardcore whitewater kayaker. And he was describing a friend of his who ended up out of his boat and was uh, camping because he didn't have any equipment. He basically had a very cold night. And I said, well, wait, don't you carry the equipment? He said it was in his boat. I said, yeah, but don't you carry it on like a, a chest pack? He goes, well, I do, but he didn't. I said, so doesn't that mean that maybe he didn't make the best choices? He goes, I'm not going to say that to him. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, I think so many people, they see you and you go, oh, Nick, that's, that's a crazy guy. 
but they don't also recognize that you've taken into account, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? Here's the warm clothing that I can put on. And I mean, maybe you have a, a warm flask or thermos of tea or, or, or hot chocolate or something like that. So you can warm yourself up. It's not like you're going out and saying, hey, I'm going to run to three of the five boroughs and see how long I can go before I end up curled up in a ball on the sidewalk because I'm too cold. No, that's not in the cards. So for people who are interested in incorporating some other atypical forms of movement into their day, say outside of running, maybe outside of walking, what are some of the other things they can do? We're all working from home now, but once people return to the office or maybe even in their home environment, are there little things they can do, maybe certain fidget moves or something along those lines that you like? I love the standing desk. One of the things that I'm a big fan of for anybody who has the ability is to hang some sort of a suspension trainer somewhere in their house. Because I know one of the big time sucks for people who want to be active, if they have to go places to be active, if you have to go to the gym, if you have to go to the yoga studio, the martial arts studio, is the time to travel to and from, depending on the time of day. Um, you know, most of us can put some sort of a suspension trainer in our home, and that can give us a little bit of resistance training. There are a variety of yoga related moves and Pilates related moves you can do on it. Um, I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of having one kettlebell in most rooms of the house. So for example, if, uh, you know, if you said, hey, can we hold on for a minute so I can go get a drink of water or use the restroom, I could hop off here and use a kettlebell. Um, you know, I'm not talking about maxing out with a 90 pound kettlebell, but for, for me or, or for you, if there's a, you know, a, a, a 20 kilo or a 25 kilo kettlebell, you know, 10 swings with good form, you know, it, it can wake it, wake and you get a little physical activity, you get a little mental stimulation. It's a little reminder. Have I been concentrating on this podcast, you know, and hunched over the microphone listening to you. So I'm a fan of that. If it strikes you, there are so many good courses now, I think it's become much more relevant since the pandemic of yoga classes and Matt Pilates classes, if that strikes you. If you listen to people and you take everything for gospel and you don't say, how does this affect me? I'd be saying, oh, I'm going to be doing cat cow all the time. Well, I've learned that I'm not special, but I'm different and I can't do that. So I think one of the things for people who are trying to incorporate is try a variety of things. What are the things that you enjoy or find beneficial? You know, one of the, one of the other things you can do if you in your home, you can put up a pull-up bar. Doesn't mean that you have to do pull-ups. Some people can say, I can't do pull-ups. Well, we can work you up to that, just hanging on it. If you're working from home and you're sitting at a desk and everything is flexion, 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 a little bit of hanging on that bar in a, both a pronated and a supinated position stretches you out, lengthens you. I've actually got a, a climbing board above my stairs as I walk downstairs. So I can walk downstairs and I can hang. It's easier to do something than to say, I'd like to do this, but not do it. An analogy I've heard that I like on the topic of yoga is that if you imagine a wheel and some of the spokes are looser than others, by engaging in a typical yoga routine, it's not at all customized to your body, your life. You're just furthering the imbalances in that wheel, the, the imbalances of those spokes. But by targeting your stretching, your yoga, your routine, you can bring all the spokes back into alignment so that it rolls normally. I think that's a great analogy. It, it reminds me of uh, what my retinal surgeon said to me once. He said, everybody's an N of one. You've mentioned some of the cool things you have in your house. Walk us through some of your home setup. I'm curious now. My home setup, and this, this has come over uh, numerous years for a variety of things. I actually am fortunate enough, as I said, that I, I live in a house. I don't live in an apartment. I have in the back area of my living room, kind of the out of the way area, I have a Pilates reformer. I was fortunate enough to work at a Pilates studio and work at some conferences for a Pilates equipment company. And they gave me the choice of discounts on equipment or getting paid. So I have a, a Pilates reformer. Um, I have a chair, actually, a Pilates chair actually here in my office. I have a set of stall bars in my hallway. So anybody who has uh, a chin up bar or a climbing board and they want something a little bit uh, more and they have wall space, Google stall bars. They're a great place to hang your suspension trainer. They're a great place for you to hang. 
I have a suspension trainer, actually gymnastic rings hanging in my living room. And before people are saying, well, why are you doing that? You can release them. So only the mount is in the ceiling. So when company comes over, you know, you can do that. You can, you can take them down. Or if it's people who are like you, they're like, oh, can I try that? I actually have a second set of suspension trainers up in my spare bedroom where I also have a BOSU ball and a weight bench and a set of adjustable dumbbells. And I've got kettlebells literally strewn throughout, not only throughout the house and also uh, some with rubber coating in my backyard. And then the final thing that's probably there on a fairly regular basis is I have a uh, low balance beam to walk on. That's probably uh, four inches off the ground, which is kind of fun. And various types of Indian clubs or, or uh, lightweighted clubs for Indian clubs swinging. What's that? Indian clubs, uh, they look like small bowling pins. There are different sizes. Lighter is better, even though you can get them to 15, 20 pounds. It's uh, something that started in India. Indian clubs and gattas or maces, which you may have heard of. I actually have a, a one or two maces. It basically is rotary motions with the shoulders bringing the torso in. And it is, if you are somebody who is a straight forward back and forth person, it's excellent for shoulder range of motion. It's just one of those things. If you've ever had one of those fidget wheels that you pick up and you just want to flick it, it's just, it, it feels good. Once you learn one or two uh, Indian club swings, it's just one of those things you walk by them and you just want to pick it up and you just want to do you know, five or six repetitions. And it's interesting because you're doing with Indian clubs as opposed to maces, which are usually done with both hands. With the Indian club, it's a single hand. It's a one or two pound club, but it's interesting to see the differences from side to side. Hmm. We like to think we're, we do things evenly, even though we're left-handed or right-handed, but we're very asymmetrical. I mean, if I was standing with you and I pushed you, inevitably you would put your favorite foot forward. One of the things that I noticed uh, a few years ago when I herniated a disc off my back on my back, uh, second time I had done it, is I noticed that when I got up off the floor, inevitably I got in a tall kneeling position. The knee that was kneeling was always my left knee, and I always would lift myself up with my right leg. So now I consciously make a choice when I go down on the floor, whether it's you know whatever it is, and we all go down on the floor multiple times a day. I'm conscious about altering which side I get up. And you'll catch yourself going to your favorite side. It'll feel really awkward. If you're somebody who lies on the floor to, to uh, you know, you read lying on the floor, you do yoga lying on the floor, whatever it is, notice how you get up. Do you always roll to the same side or do you alter it? You know, most of us, when we get out of bed, because we're on one side of the bed, we go to that one side. But when you get off the floor, can you roll to both sides? There's a, a movement I don't want to call it a class, but there are certifications out there called MoveNet that is very interesting where they make you do these little basic movements that we should be able to do. You know, you should be able to, provided you don't have some sort of a major orthopedic injury or neural injury that prevents you. If you're sitting on the floor, you should be able to get up using your left leg to lift you up or your right leg. And if you can't, you want to ask yourself, you know, is it because it's a habit? Is it because I'm not coordinating? Coordinated? Is it because it hurts? And if it hurts, why? But don't just say, well, you know, I'm 53 and I can't get up using my left leg anymore. I have to use my right leg. Why is that? And can we do something to prevent it? Because if you can't do it at 53, what's going to happen when you're 63? What are some of the other move not principles or basic at home tests you can do to detect and fix imbalances? Very carefully, I've used this with, with a number of older clients. Stork stand, can you stand on an individual leg? And, and people say, well, yeah, I'm not, I don't have time to do that. Most of us brush our teeth every day. So put the toothbrush in one hand, lightly put your fingers on the counter with the other hand so that you have a little bit of balance. And I've got an electric toothbrush that buzzes every 30 seconds. You stand on the left leg for 30 seconds. Can you do that? Switch. Switch hands too if you want it because think about it. You probably brush your hands uh, the same way. I think I read on your webpage when you were young, you broke an arm and you started using the other arm. Yep. If you remember back, remember how difficult it was the first time you probably had to use the toothbrush with your other hand? These are little things that we, that we think about. But I mean, the, the balance, can you do that? So when, when you hear somebody say, or when you think about it, you say, I can't do this. And I think so many of us say, I can't do that because 
we may have gotten a participation trophy or boy, that's a really good job, Nick, whereas maybe it wasn't a good job. Things that are worthwhile should be hard. And I would encourage everybody if they have to work from home or do work from home, access to a standing desk because it's that little bit of fidgeting. I mean, I'm moved around quite a bit. I don't want to say somebody should stay all day there, but it's a conscious choice so that when you walk in, you have to say, do I sit? Do I stand? I think that yes, standing might be better than sitting, but standing stationary in the same exact position for eight hours straight isn't what the body is designed to do. And there's all kinds of different positions you can get into from sitting on the floor to kneeling to one knee down, other knee up to both knees down. There's like all kinds of different ones. And I think it's best to move the, the body and distribute the fluids throughout by changing positions every once in a while. There's a well-known physical therapist out there, Dr. Shirley Sarman, who has written a number of books. These are great books for anybody who's a mover. These are not books you pick up and you read cover to cover. You pick it up and read three or four pages and kind of think about it and come back and read those same three or four pages and think about it and talk to a friend. But one of the things that she's written in her book, and this is backed up with research, is muscle and body tissue is plastic. So we want to try to avoid holding a position for more than 20 minutes. So to get back to what you say, I would agree with that. You know, figure out what can you do to not hold the same position 20 minutes, more than 20 minutes. I mean, obviously if you're flying someplace, that's not often practical if the pilot has the fast of your seatbelt sign on. But I know when I go to department meetings at my college, I sit in the back and you'll, you'll find me if the meeting's going 40, 50 minutes as it does, I'll stand in the back. You know, I'll get out of the desk and just sit back. You're not disruptive doing it. You know, you'll see me if, if I'm talking on the phone, not so much in the podcast, I'll be stepping off of this. I'll be coming, coming on. I'll be putting my leg up on it. And I think that's a great thing. One of the things I found when I first started using the standing desk is I use it exclusively. I don't put it down. I go to someplace else and use a laptop in the house. But one of the things I found is if I spent more than about 20 or 25 minutes just standing, not on a wobble board, my back got sore. So you're kind of like, okay, so is that one of those micro times where you do that concentrated work and then give yourself a five minute break? Or is this something I need to work up to? And then I realized like, no, this is okay. I shouldn't be holding. I shouldn't just be standing here working on the keyboard for that much. It's kind of, that's my body saying, okay, take a break, take a mental break, you know, swing the kettlebell 10 times, go down and get a glass of water, pet the dog, um, do deep breathing, just do something different and then come back. And I think one of the things for me that's the benefit of the standing desk is I get that built in because too often if I sit at a computer and I'm doing work, it's going to be two hours later. It's like, oh boy, I feel like crap. I've been in a bad posture. So by standing and having to engage my body for me, not for everybody, it's telling me after 15, 20 minutes, okay, Ben, take a break, go on to something else, come back to this. I follow a productivity system called Pomodoro. And every like 30 minutes, I'll take a one minute break. And that way I'm coming back to the project with fresh eyes. I get the blood flowing with some quick exercise, kettlebell swings, jumping jacks, mountain climbers, burpees, whatever it is. And I can reconnect with the people around me, have some conversation, grab water, whatever it is. But building that like forced break into my schedule makes me both more productive and healthier. Yeah, I mean, I know one of the things that I don't know if I'm proud of it, but I knew it worked for me. I never pulled an all-nighter in college. And when I wrote my dissertation, I never spent more than 20 minutes at one time writing. That doesn't mean I spent 20, 20 minutes a day. It means I just stepped away and, and did something else. And partially that was a conscious choice. And partially it was what I found is like, I don't do well with large blocks of time. I do well with small blocks repeatedly. And I think one of the things when we're talking to people, if you're talking about somebody who's looking at incorporating movement, not exercise necessarily, but more movement in their life, think small blocks like you just described. Somebody says, well, I don't have time. It's like, well, you did that 30 minute block. You've got five minutes or three minutes or whatever it is. How long does it take to do five air squats? You know, go talk to your friend in the next cubicle, do the five air squats. Um, and you, you see there are people everybody's different. Everybody's an N of one. And what you can do is you can take a little bit from one person, a little bit from another person, a little bit from another person. And pretty soon you have your, this is what works for me. And 
when you share it with people, that's good. As long as you're not saying, this is the only way to do it, only do it this way. And if you don't do it this way, you're doing it wrong because that's probably not the right way to go. How do you feel about traditional exercise? Do you layer that on top of your micro movement throughout the day? I do. Many of your listeners are probably familiar with the World Health Organization, ACSM, three to five uh, days a week of aerobic exercise, you know, up to 300 minutes to maybe three days of resistance training. And it's kind of like, well, that's great. But if you only do that and you do nothing else physical, you're pretty much a sedentary person. And if you think about the things that you have the opportunity, opportunity to do, you know, if you're going to have grandkids, what you're doing now is setting you up for what you can do with your grandkids 30 years down the line. Um, so I like the layering, but, but the other thing is many, many people, you and I are talking and many of your listeners who are listening to this, we're the extremes. We're the people who do all these things. We enjoy movement. The vast majority of people don't. So if you say to somebody, you know, if you've got a brother and your brother doesn't like to exercise and you say, well, you got to go to the gym four days a week and get on the treadmill or do the Stairmaster or swim or do something. And you have to do it at least 20 minutes. And ideally we want to work you up to 60 minutes and, oh yeah, you got to come back two other days and you've got to do eight to 12 resistance training exercise. If they're not doing anything, they're going to look at you and go, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Or they'll do it and they'll burn out because that's so much more than they've been doing. On the other hand, if you say, hey, you know, let's meet three days a week at lunchtime. Let's go for a 15 minute walk and then I'll take you to lunch. That's 15 minutes more or 45 minutes more a week than they've got. You've got the opportunity with them to not preach, but lead by example, you know, because they're saying, oh, this is what he's doing. Maybe I'll try that. And what I tell clients that I work with, you know, there's all these fancy training programs and things that you can do. If you can do about 75 to 80% of what you plan to do, that's a success. And when you consider so many people aren't even walking or doing anything physical for 30 minutes a day, anything that we can do. Um, one other thing to add into that, I, I say one of the great things about the internet is there's so much information. One of the bad things is there's so much information. Um, and this is another one of those I saw it somewhere and it's just kind of stuck in my mind, but we've set ourselves up in the way that we live is it's possible to go for most of us to go through our entire day and not have to lift our arms above our heads. So mm. think about not so much with you or me, but think about maybe your mom or your grandmother. And you think about it, if you ask them to pick up something high off a shelf and the last time that they lifted their arms up like that was maybe when you were you know, three months old and they were lifting you up like that. So I think what it is, is layering exercise or workouts is very important. That is important. We'd like to see everybody do that. What can you do in addition to that? Because one of the things we know is being active, being mobile, not necessarily in a workout, but doing low intensity movement is beneficial physically, psychologically, and has the effect of allowing us to be more active for a longer period of time in our life or enhancing our health span. Uh, I mentioned Don Moxley a few minutes ago. One of the things he reminded me of, we're starting, I'm starting to host a podcast with him that hasn't been released yet. When you think about things that factor into your life, genetics are only 20 to 30%. What you do or don't do is the remainder. So you know, you and I were talking, I think, before we recorded about intermittent fasting. I said, I found it doesn't work for me. And you mentioned there are certain times you do it and certain times you don't do it. There are probably you and I could sit down and have, uh, have a meal or, or have a beer, or have a glass of wine or something like that and talk. And we could probably come up with 75 or 80 things that we both do put together. Probably about 30 of them I do and you don't do. 30 of them you do and I don't do. 20 of them we both do. And I'll bet each one of us would come away with saying, oh, maybe I can incorporate that or maybe that's better than, than this, you know? And I think that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind is like, yes, that exercise is important, but what can we do on top of that? And part of it is how do we incorporate it into our lives? You know, if it's pets, if it's making the norm for the family is you go for a walk after dinner. If the norm is when you meet friends, instead of saying, hey, let's meet and get a glass of wine, say, hey, let's take a walk. Or if you're fortunate enough to have friends, hey, let's go for a run or, or something like that. 
in my own experience, I've become aware recently that I'm doing a lot of work in the sagittal plane, forward and backward, running, walking, that kind of thing. And while that's great, I'm not getting as much training in other planes of movement, say side to side. So I've been working on more of that to build the stabilizer muscles and to make sure that I'm not developing any severe imbalances so that one day when I go to do certain movements, I don't injure myself. Two things, first of all, wow, isn't that hard to do those things? And second of all, as you master it or remaster it, because probably you had it when you were a kid, it's like, boy, that's a lot of fun. Um, I'm reminded, uh, as I mentioned a few years ago, when I herniated a disc, I really reincorporated things. And about eight months later, I went out uh, sea kayaking with, with a good friend of mine. And the first thing I noticed is, wow, my rotation is so good. I was really able to power through. And then the next morning I woke up and I realized that I had spent a significant amount of time working on my mobility in, the, in that plane, in the rotary plane, and I had spent less time working in the strength. And when the mobility is better than the strength and you're doing something like that, certain things don't necessarily like it. And it's important as you're working on correcting those imbalances to say, we want motion, but we want motion to go along with strength. So you don't run into a situation like I did where you wake up the next morning and go, Ooh, I think maybe there's a problem there. Ultimately the difference between mobility and flexibility. Yes, ex exactly. And I kind of look at it when these things happen to me, what you do long-term actually has effect on what you do in this one time. Um, I suspect if you're having, if you're reintroducing those movements, if you look up Indian clubs, I, I see you have high ceilings, you're going to become a big fan of, of a set of those. You can buy really fancy wood ones, or you can buy a, a cheap set of plastic ones. They all function the same. I've actually got a plastic set that's been sitting on my patio for the last mm. three years for when I go outside and wait for the dogs to finish <laughs> doing what they do. And the other thing is, think about balance beams. I mean, these little short, there's a, a group out there called the Foot Collective. They show various balance beam things, or as I said, I use a guardrail, because even though it is that sagittal plane, by putting one foot in front of the other, you're doing that single leg stance. And I remember the first time I tried to do it, it's like, oh, this is something I should probably be able to do on. And then you'll find when you're out on those jaunts in the city, you know, whether it's running in the rain or, or practicing things when it's cold out, and you come across like a, a fence with a nice wide top or a, a stone wall, it's like... I want to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people who, if I'm going to take a few minutes down and surf the internet, I'm going to look up the, uh, the BMX riders or the parkour athletes. Not that I want to do that, but you <laughs> see those things and it's like, okay, maybe you get a small idea, not saying I'm going to jump off a building and land on, on a small chain link fence. Yeah. It's inspiring. I love that concept as well. The atypical movements such as injecting some novelty and spontaneity into the routine whether it's walking on guardrails it's climbing a fence climbing a tree you name it those kind of things have so much value and i find that when i do those i feel like physically younger and that like radiates throughout my personality even when i stop doing them one of the things i've started doing very often my girlfriend would come with me when we take the dogs to the park we have a nerf football We'll throw the Nerf football around as we're walking the dogs. I mean, think about when you were a kid, how often did you probably, I mean, some people didn't, but many people did throw a baseball around, throw a football around, throw a wiffle ball around. And it's just to have that motion and to do it. It's just, it's kind of like, it's fun. And I mean, I think so much when we, when we think about the regimented workouts and you go to a class and I don't want to pick on Peloton because I think they do a great job of community, but the advertisements that, that I've seen recently on TV you know, they're getting people to move. That's phenomenal. But you know, you crushed it. You did it. You know, you worked hard. Things are supposed to be fun. If we're looking at things that we're going to need to do or have to do or want to do for hopefully the next 30, 40, 50 years, at least 70 to 80% of that stuff has to be fun because you mentioned you hate to run. So if I told you, look, Nick, you've got to run, you've got to run 30 minutes, which is not excessive, but you've got to run 30 minutes at least six days a week for the rest of the year. Mentally, you're gonna be going, yeah, no, I can't do this. But if I'm gonna say you're gonna go out and we're gonna throw the Frisbee around for 30 minutes, four days a week, one day a week, we're gonna go someplace and we're gonna run on steps 
And the final day, we're just going to have fun. We're going to go to the park with, with, with my friend's dog, and we're going to run around with the dog and have fun. You've done basically the same effect, but you've done things that you've done different things. And hopefully those are things that you enjoy. So I'm not saying everything that we do in our movement practices we enjoy. There are some times when I do my mobility work, I don't enjoy it. I do it because I recognize it's going to get me what I want to do. But there are enough times when I can introduce something new or introduce something fun or see that there's an improvement or a change or I feel better. It's like, okay, I want to do this. I will, and this is not to knock yoga. I brought this before. I will not go to a yoga class. I don't enjoy it. That doesn't mean yoga is bad. I will not go to a spin class. I don't enjoy it. I want to be outside. Doesn't mean it's bad. It just means for me, I know that if I'm going to be somebody who's going to do those sorts of things, I can't do it in a class because it's not enjoyable. Other people who love that class atmosphere, it is. So you got to find whether it's movement, whether it's exercise, whether it's a workout, whether it's an incorporation of all of those things, find things that you enjoy the majority of the time. I see that as one of the pressing issues in the fitness industry, the whole notion of going to a workout. And if you don't spend 45 minutes in a high intensity class, you waste your time and it's a little preposterous. But the marketing is out there. The marketing has made everyone believe that a high intensity workout needs to be intense. It needs to be long. And from working with different people and seeing their vitals in response to those classes, it crushes them. It crushes them for days afterward, yet they've been told by their instructor they need to come back within two days. Life is stressful. I mean, one of the things we, we, we all have to realize, and sometimes we realize it faster than others, is life is stressful. You're not going to eliminate stress. There's good stress or use stress. There's bad stress or distress. And it's how we manage it. So if you're working and living in New York City, there is, to some degree, there's background noise. So there's always noise. So to some degree, that has some sort of level of stress on you. Sometimes it's good. Four o'clock in the morning when it's a police siren or an ambulance, it's bad. Um, interacting with people. This conversation we're having is a stress. It could be a good stress or a bad stress. Exercise is a stress. It can be a good stress as long as we don't do too much. It can be a bad stress if we do too much. But so much, as you said, it's like you need to go hard. I mean, how, how many times in the last week have you heard somebody say you have to crush it? You have to hit it. You need to, you know, I would much rather see somebody move at a lower intensity and enjoy it than move at a higher intensity. I mean, one, one, of the, one of the things we know is, you know, high intensity is good, but you burn out really quickly. So it's a little bit, just like people say, well, I haven't had dessert in, in uh, six years. Well, I had dessert today. I had a biscotti, but I also did quite a bit of exercise today and it was a small biscotti. So that high intensity training, that's just a small portion and it's fun, you know, it's loud, the lights are bright, it can excite you if you've had a, a stressful day. Like a dance club. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a dance club exciting atmosphere. But you gotta do some other stuff too. You know, it's kind of like, if you're gonna have that biscotti, you gotta have your vegetables too. And I agree 100%. And I mean, I'm in that field. I've, uh, you're not the first person I've talked about that with. We've done a horrible job of introducing people of the benefits of workouts, exercise and just the overall picture of movement because so many people don't move. I mean, if you think you've probably incorporated a group of friends or a, a group of individuals who have at least some similarities to you. So if you call them up and say, hey, let's walk to wherever when we're going out to dinner, one or two of them are going to say, yeah, you know, it's raining, but Nick usually shows us something, something pretty cool happens on that. You and I are the abnormalities in the country. Most people don't do that. Most people are going to say, where's the Uber? We want to do that. I mean, one of the things, I've got to go to a, a conference in Disney uh, next month. There's going to be like a 40-story hotel. Inevitably, I'm going to take the stairs. Love it. Why am I going to take the stairs? A, because for me to sit there and wait for the elevator, I'm going to twitch. And B, it's like, okay, I've just been sitting at listening to people talk, sitting in meetings. Now I've got the opportunity to walk upstairs. And I mean, that's something that maybe it's a conscious choice for my education, but I know my dad was always, we took the stairs. You know, you went someplace, you took the stairs. When he uh, worked as a minister and he would visit people in the hospital, he'd take the stairs because it's an easy way to get movement in. And very often, um, 
you know, I have to go to Allegheny General every three months to get a to get an eye situation checked out. And I park in the sixth or seventh story of the parking garage and have to go down to the ground floor. And inevitably, I see people walking and waiting for the elevator and I'm on the ground floor before the elevator gets down there. Here in Pittsburgh, we, somebody was recommended to me and I, I contacted her and she said, well, I'm not really an athlete. I don't really, you know, I don't do that much. And it's like, well, what do you do? It's like, well, I swim three or four days a week. I like to go. I put my headphones on and I listen to books on tape. And I, the days that I don't swim, I walk. And at least three days a month, I, I go ballroom dancing. And this was a woman in her 70s. It's like, no, that's exactly who I want to talk to. You know, if you ask her, are you working out? She said no. But she's doing significantly more activity than that person who's going to that class three days a week and says, yeah, I went to the gym three days this week. Oh, boy, I'm really good. Let's go out and get nachos, cheeseburgers, and uh, mixed drinks all night long because I was so good this week. And the irony is that the original Tabata protocol, the one that a lot of the high intensity fitness classes are built around, was actually a, only a total of four minutes of work time. So these 45 minute classes really can be compressed down into four minutes. Yeah, and there's the gentleman Martin uh, Gabala, I believe. Yeah, looks at the looks at very short term intensity, and we need to think about that. It's like we need to look at what are the benefits we get from that because there's no question that high intensity exercise has some benefits in small quantities. On the other hand, there are huge benefits from just motion or mobility or walking you know, th that you can't get from that, just both physical and psychological. One of the things that I've so many people that I talk to who walk, who run, talk about is they talk about the mental calmness that they get about or how much better they feel or the ideas. I mentioned that all of my good ideas and yes, most of my bad ideas come when, I, when I'm out with the dogs, but there's just a sense when you are moving uh, that does something psychologically that it's relaxing. And you can't get that if you're in that dance club atmosphere, or even if you're at home locked in a dark room on your treadmill or your Stairmaster, you know, there's something relatively low intensity where there's blood flow, but you can kind of use your brain, but not have to use your brain, if that makes sense. It does. Well, Ben, we could talk for hours, but let's start to wrap this one up. Before I ask you the final questions, where can those that are interested connect with you, find your podcast or work with you? The best way, because one of the things, there's so many social media things out there. We've done a really good job with uh, SEO. The best way is um, Google Fitness Lab Pittsburgh or Fit Lab PGH. If you Google F-I-T-L-A-B PGH, about the first four pages are going to be Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, YouTube and those are all going to allow you to have contact information with me. So that's basically, if you remember FitLab PGH, um, I think the great thing that I have to say about this that I, I've had the most fun and I've had the most, I think people have benefited from is we do three times a week, one minute movement tip lifestyle hack videos, just little things. Um, our theme for this month is we're doing it for June is we're talking about motivation. Our ultimate motivation is to increase health span. But little things like make just one minute things. A lot of times it's in the woods. Um, very often it's you're going to see two Labradors bouncing around next to me. So if you like dogs, just shut the sound off and do that. And I think that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. Great. All right. We will move on to the rapid fire round now. Imagine that there is a burning of the books, so to speak, and that all knowledge on earth is gone. You get to choose three works of any kind, be it podcasts, books, videos, people. What would you choose? This is going to be uh, two books in a book series. And, I, and it's, uh, I, th I think it'll encompass many things. So the first book that I would include would be The Joy of Cooking. It's a, it's a cookbook. Anybody who is a cook probably knows of it but it has more than cooking. It tells you how to break down a chicken and things like that. And if all knowledge is gone, you're gonna to have to figure out ways to feed yourself. And this is gonna teach you a wide variety of cooking, literally from vegan cooking to totally carnivore. So I think The Joy of Cooking would be the first book. That reminds me of Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Chef. And it's a book on the science of effective learning called meta-learning disguised as a cookbook. 
the asabuco recipe that he has in there is phenomenal. I've <laughs> used it a no, number of times. <laughs> My second book, uh, again, because all knowledge is gone, is there. Is, there's a book out there. Um, I'm pretty sure it's available on Kindle. It's called Backyard Farming on an Acre or Less. So if we lost all knowledge, we're going to have to figure out some ways to figure out what plants are edible, uh, and we're going to have to figure out how to grow some things. So I think one of the things that I've probably been remiss on in my life is being more active in growing things. I grow a few vegetables and things like that, but probably not as much as I would like to. The perfect place to start is with sprouts. That's what I've been doing this year. Yeah, I've got, I basically I'm with uh, ba baby greens and basil. Hmm. And then the final one, and I'm not sure if any of your listeners have heard of this, is there was a series of books that was based on a high school project in Rabin County, Georgia, called the Foxfire series. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I've heard of it. Um, and this was a high school teacher or uh, English department that told their students to go out and interview various people in Appalachia about things that were being lost, skills that were being lost. So I believe there's a 12, maybe even 14 volumes. And I believe to some extent, it still goes on to this day, but literally everything from how to make soap to how to make a still. And it's just a whole bunch of how to cook different things. And it's just a fascinating, it's kind of like the Shirley Sarman books. You would not pick up one of these and read it cover to cover. You kind of pick it up kind of like some of the books Tim Ferriss has put out. You don't read them cover to cover. You say, oh, he's talking to Amelia Boone or, oh, he's talking to Bill Gates. I want to, I want to see what he says about that. Um, so Joy of Cooking, Backyard Farming on an Acre or Less and the Foxfire book series. Good answers. What are you most interested in in researching these days? Well, I'm 53. Um, so I remember a good friend of mine who's about 12 years older than me, who was a training partner when I was in, in grad school. I remember talking to him four or five years after I graduated. He said, you know, I, I could see the end, you know, and I would say probably four or five years ago, I started to realize, you know, intellectually, I'm not, I'm not invincible. I mean, at some point there is the, the end point. I'm fortunate enough that my family has been relatively long lived. And I say semi jokingly that, you know, I want to live to be 104. And people, when I say that they either say, yeah, I agree. Or they look at me and go, that's crazy. And I say that because there's so many things that I want to do. There's so many things that I'm curious about. Um, so I would say probably the thing I'm most interested in is figuring out how do I enhance that health span? Um, I've used that a couple of times. I got to credit Don Moxley with uh, really reminding me of that. Health span being, I want to figure out ways that I can be physically active, that I can be mentally active, that I can have good relationships, that I can have my health so that I can continue to explore these things that interest me. So I would say working on health span or quality of life is probably what I'm most interested in. Lifespan plus maintaining quality of life throughout those years. Equals health span. But I'm curious, why 104? I don't know. I just popped it up. My, my uh, <laughs> paternal grandmother lived to be 102. As I said uh, at a podcast I was on a few weeks ago, I said, you know, I say 104. It could be. Maybe I'm being underly optimistic, maybe with work that people like uh, Dr. David Sinclair are doing, you know, maybe 104 is going to be the norm. You know, there's, there's these areas of the, of the world called the blue zones where people live to be quite old. And, you know, as you start to look at more things, you know, we mentioned earlier in the podcast, it's all, it's a cumulative effect of all these little things we do and don't do. Maybe I'm being underly optimistic and maybe it's going to be, maybe it's going to be longer than that. You know, maybe it'll be shorter than that. I, I hope it's not, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to do as many things as I can to say 104 is a good spot. Ask me in five years and I may say it's longer. Yeah. Okay. What's the number one thing you believe that virtually nobody else does? I've mentioned it a couple of times. You and I are the extremes. We are the minority and the people who take movement as the important priority in life and one of the most essential things up there with food up there with sleep are the minority so i would say the thing that i believe that most people don't believe people like you accept of course movement needs to be a lifestyle not just an activity i mean it's it's an ethos that i have but i mean the more i see it um 
just a, a quick story for your, for your fans who are animal lovers. I had a dog that had idiopathic epilepsy and she lived for four years, was on like nine meds by the end. It was not well controlled. And what I was able to see and what the neurologist for her said is because I walked her most days, we did fart like training. We did whatever she wanted to do. Whatever you're doing with this dog, keep doing it. She's alert, she's engaged, and she should not be like this with all these medicines she's on. She should be like a zombie. Wow. Her quality of life literally up until the day I had to put her down was above and beyond. And so much of it, I think, was linked to the fact that she got out and moved most days of her life. So if it's good for the dogs, it's good for me. With you on that. What's something that your tribe, the Fit Lab PGH tribe, doesn't know about you? Believe it or not, I'm an introvert and I'm shy. So if you told me, say, in 2016, hey, Ben, you're going to have a podcast and you're going to cold call people and ask them to be on the podcast and you're going to actively try to get on podcasts, I'd say, yeah, probably not. The interesting thing is I've never been nervous about speaking in front of 100 people or 1,000 people public speaking, but doing a one-on-one -on -one thing has al was always nerve-wracking. And I would say like 2016, 2017, something just clicked. And it's like, you know, these are things I'm interested in doing. And if I want to do this, if I want to reach out and talk to interesting people, I'm going to have to step outside of my comfort zone. Worst that can happen is I could be completely embarrassed and chances are five years from now, nobody's going to remember it. Great words to live by. How would you like to conclude our journey together tonight? I'd like to uh, encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. I mean, one of the things you pick up little pieces here and there, I'm not just saying this gratuitously, I enjoyed reading the uh, article you had recently on the biostrap. I think one of the things that, that that's so important out there is there are so many things in the movement field that are dogmatic, do this or don't do that. And there are so many gray areas. And I think from, from uh, people like you who are willing to say, hey, I tried this, this is what the effects were on me. Essentially, try at your own risk, because as I know, if you and I talked in our first talk when we weren't recording, you know, medicine probably isn't going to be able to help us before a problem occurs. So we're going to have to look outside of it. And I would say to listeners, be a consumer and take as much uh, responsibility for your body as you do taking care of your air conditioning system in your house or your apartment or your computer, or your car if you have a car. So really, what you do or don't do with your body is just like how you do or don't treat your car. And it seems like a simplistic thing, but most of us spend more time looking for a mechanic for our car rather than we do thinking about what are we going to put in our mouth? How are we going to make time to move? How are we going to make sure we get a good quality sleep? How are we going to manage these stressful situations that we know we can't avoid? So we need to be able to manage the stress or we're going to have problems. And like you said, every additional voice counts while our experiences may differ. Ultimately, your understanding expands from hearing my experience of the same thing. And since the future of medicine and health, wellness, fitness is all personalized and tailored to the individual, it takes some trial and error, but understanding the people who came before you, what they went through can only help. It can. I mean, you know, most of us aren't coming up with anything new. It's thinking about things that exist in a different way or being able to say, wow, I never thought of it that way. That's an entirely different way of looking at it. And that makes sense or that doesn't make sense. Thanks so much, Ben. It's been a pleasure chatting with you tonight. And I'm looking forward to following along with your journeys in the Fit Lab PGH podcast. Nick, thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it and uh, I've gotten a lot out of it. I hope you have too. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any changes.